Well, welcome to uh, the first in a series of uh, winter weekend workshops, talks, meet the teams, demonstrations, whatever, just th things to keep us uh, busy during lockdown. And uh, today um, we're going to be emceed by Feelock and our speaker is going to be Keith Leach talking about uh, the Hastings Jack in the Green Festival. So I'd just like to um, say hello and um, hand over to Fee. Hello, thanks Pauline. Um, in addition to being the Secretary of the Morris Federation, I've also been the Secretary of Hastings Jack in the Green for some time. Um, it's um, a traditional custom which was started pretty much formally in 1983, although there'd been a couple of outings informally um, a couple of years beforehand. Um, it's changed remarkably little over the years. It's got bigger. Um, but essentially, it's still um, a walking bush being paraded around the streets of Hastings and then ritually slain um, to release the spirit of summer. Um, we couldn't do this without the, the cooperation and help of the people of Hastings. And we feel very strongly that it is their um, tradition as well. And we have massive help from Hastings Borough Council um, in the form of Kevin Borman, who is the leisure, leisure manager. Um, Keith Leach um, has been the chairman for many, many years. Um, we have recently converted to becoming a charitable, in, a charitable incorporated organisation, which was a massive change for us, uh, but it's only been very, very good. Um, and the ethos remains as it was in the beginning in that we do this um, and it's great to have people coming along but we would do it even if nobody turned up and in fact we did it last year when obviously nobody could turn up um we'll be taking questions as we go as well as there being a q a at the end but uh enough from me over to keith hi there thank you fee uh yes fee's been the secretary of jack in the green for yonks and yonks just like i've been chair uh and uh what I, what I intend to do is to show a little video to start with to give a feel of what it's all about, uh, then move on and uh, do a, a PowerPoint talking about the history and, and, and so on, and, and, and then receive questions about the custom. But also some of you may be interested in, in how we set it up, how to's, that sort of thing, because over the past gosh, how many years? 30 plus years now. Um, we've also got very good at doing things like uh, safety advisory groups and risk assessments and all that kind of stuff. So, so we can talk about that as well. Uh, so this year, as, as Fee said, Jack and the Green actually went virtual. So I'm kind of used to Zoom, cut, cut, my, uh, cut my teeth with Zoom uh, in, in the only way possible by doing Jack in the Green online with a local uh, isolation station, broadcast station, and we had a live audience of 20,000. So you're small in comparison. So, but at the same time, they were doing more of the driving. And I'm going I'm to now attempt to drive you through a quick video just to give you a flavour of, of what we're talking about. Um, OK, what I'm going to do now, I'm going to run through a, uh, a quick PowerPoint. Yeah. OK, so, you know, why, why, do, why do we decorate with leaves and flowers in the spring? And of course, a lot of people have this sort of ideas about Celticness and, and, and all the rest of it and, and, and Beltane. And uh, 
the Scots have, have, have taken to this in Edinburgh and they put on this great big thing and they make out it's terribly old and all the rest of it. Uh, and, and it isn't. Um, in fact, I think it's much more to do with the May Games. The May Games uh, were here uh, in, in, in medieval times, right the way through uh, until the Reformation. They were a really important part of. Uh, they were a really important part of um, ooh, of, uh, of of proceedings, and uh, they were the, the equivalent of, of, of a modern day church fate. And, and here we've got May Games uh, with. with Morris dancing and with a maypole and people drinking and bear baiting and, and, and all those kinds of things. And, and they ran all the way from the 1st of May until the end of May. And uh, they were a very important thing in, in the year. And I, I think most of our May customs are actually from this route rather than from anything else. Now, amongst that, of course, you've got maypoles, you've got maypole dancing. Uh, the uh, the small maypole you see to the right, the kids maypole, that's actually more of a 19th century thing. It was it was brought in in the 19th century to uh, for, for for kids to do because the the maypole to the left was 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 considered to be far too debauched. But the larger maypoles are the ones that were here first, and the kids maypoles, uh, those are the ones that uh, came in the 19th century. Very few surviving large maypoles. This is this is the largest one in England in Burwick, which is in uh, Northumberland, I believe. Um, uh, but very few of them left. But they're around and about the place. Okay, so what we're trying to establish here is is is, is the idea that the May customs are almost certainly based on the May games, and that the May games were the medieval equivalent of a church fate, and it was the way in which the church in particular was making money. But at the same time, in those days, church and community were very much interlinked, and therefore um, it was a big community party. Uh, and there are various vestiges of this around the country. Down in the West Country, you have, obviously, you have the famous Patsto May Day custom, but it's not the only one. There's also the Minehead Hobby Horse. And if you go to North Devon, if you go to Coombe Martin, they had the hunting of the Earl of Rome. The hunting of the Earl of Rome is actually a revival, like Jack in the Green in Hastings is a revival. <coughs> and the hunting of the Earl of Rome uh, takes place on the late May bank holiday. And it's certainly worth going to. They're a very friendly bunch. And uh, it's lovely to meet them. And of course, being a, a May custom person myself, uh, I was welcomed to their stable with open arms, which was lovely. Um, let's have a look at the actual Jacks in the Green then and try and work out where they come from. You've got uh, May Garlands. And the May Garlands um, have been around for a very long time. This, these would be bowers of leaves or flowers that would be carried around on May Day, in particular by children. And within these May Garlands, it, you'd often find a doll. And that doll would be to represent the Virgin Mary. So once again, we've got a link here, actually, with the medieval church. As you move into the 18th, 19th century, people are moving into the cities. Um, and most of the Jacks in the Green actually came out of London. And within London, you had milkmaids. And the milkmaids would process around the streets on May the 1st, carrying these garlands either on their hats or on trolleys, and they'd be covered in flowers, but also covered in silverware. They'd go around dancing, playing tunes, apparently always badly, 
and the um, people would complain about that. The different guilds in London each had their own May custom and each one was carrying their own things. The chimney sweepers <coughs> carried around a jack in the green. And the jack in the green was so large that you had to climb inside it. And once you had climbed inside the jack in the green, you then carried it around. And, and it, this became the biggest garland. I mean, nobody could actually beat this as a garland idea. Uh, and, and therefore, in a way, the chimney sweep was one. <coughs> and they'd have various characters that they would have dancing around with them. Uh, there'd be a lord and there'd be a lady uh, and uh, usually an exceptionally bad musician. Uh, and the lady would be known as Black Sal. And the reason for this is because you can see they've got soot from the chimneys just smudged on their faces because they are chimney sweeps. Um, it's definitely an urban tradition. I think... This is possibly the corner of Regent Street or somewhere like that. Uh, and you can see the Jack in the Green, and you can see some clowns, uh, and you can see the various characters dancing around it. But it's, <coughs> don't, don't go thinking that this is one of your typical rural ideals that everybody does. No, it's an urban tradition and it's carried on by the chimney sweeps. And this urban tradition. Um, this urban tradition <coughs> came out from London to the places surrounding London. So as uh, new towns and new places were being built in the 19th century, they needed workers. And those workers were coming out of London to work in those new places. <coughs> and so the larger new uh, industrial Dockland and seaside towns in the south of England started to get their own jacks in the green as they grew with 19th century tourism. And those places included Rochester, Whitstable, and of course, Hastings. Uh, they also went out in the other direction and they went out towards Oxford. And we've got um, Oxford out there, out there as well. So definitely the chimney sweeps. Just to insert something, Keith, yeah. that but going back, Barwick, Barwick is uh, near Leeds. Thanks to near Leeds. That. Right, um, thanks. The other, the other thing I'm going to interject on, on is um, about the chimney sweeps um, and the milkmaids. I think it's worth bearing in mind that the milkmaids wouldn't have been these fluffy things that you see from the cast of Oliver. They were farm worker women. They were hugely powerful. And so it's entirely consistent that they would be able to carry these huge, great big garlands because they would have been <laughs> strapping women. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, this is almost certainly Trafalgar Square. Um, okay, so they, they, they came out from London, they went to the surrounding urban areas. <clears throat> okay, so what of Hastings? Well, different places have been blessed or not blessed in the amount of information that we've got on their Jackson the Green. And in Hastings, we have been particularly blessed because there is more information about the Hastings Jack in the Green within the records than there is of anywhere else. And this is uh, other than maybe Deptford, but certainly outside of London. And this is because the local press uh, were interested in it and for 20, 30 years afterwards, we're still writing uh, about it and still writing uh, about where it had been and what had happened and so on. So every year you, you, you would find it. Uh, I need to recommend this book, by the way. It's not my book. It's uh, Roy Judge's book, The Jack in the Green by Roy Judge. Roy being the person that really did the major research in Jack in the Green. And as it so happened, was born in St. Leonard's on Sea, which is where the Hastings Jack in the Green actually first started. This is St. Leonard's on Sea. Um, this is the subscription gardens in St. Leonard's on Sea. <coughs> and here we have an actual photograph 
of the people who carried the Hastings Gap in the Green uh, in May, probably about 1865. First Jacks in the Green, by the way, were recorded in Crystal Palace in about 1780. So here we have them. These are the people carrying the Jack in the Green. Interesting to notice that they are not wearing the uh, <coughs> um, Admiral costume that they're wearing in London. They are wearing rag suits. And you can see two people here wearing rag suits. They do have something on their face, presumably chimney soot. Uh, this guy is known as the fat man with the drum. And we know, because we've checked it out, <coughs> that round the corner from where this photograph was taken, according to the census, there was a chimney sweep called Charles Lee. And we believe that this is Charles Lee and his family, and that is probably Charles Lee. So, so we know quite a lot about them and their antics. Apparently, oh, and there's Mary Andrew the clown. Apparently, they got exceptionally drunk and did things like fall through plate glass windows and, and had a very good time. <coughs> when I, <clears throat> I'm, I moved to Hastings probably about 40 years ago now. And uh, when I arrived in town, I, I was interested in what customs there were or might have been in the past because I'd been working in London with various people on uh, looking at traditional customs. I was a part of research groups up there and so on. <clears throat> so I'd got the research bug. And when I came down here, I, I did what you call um, date spotting. Uh, I knew about Sussex bonfires. Uh, so, uh, and, and, and there was a big bonfire still happening in the back or just up the road, 400 years old. And that was a safe custom. <clears throat> I was more interested in, in Hastings itself and what was going on around here. So I did some date spotting, looking at old papers from the end, well, from the beginning of May for two weeks and could not believe the wealth of material that we had. And it became completely obvious that Jack and the Green needed to return to the town <coughs> and, and therefore did. And memory begins to fail me as to the precise date when that happened. Oh, a long time ago. My daughter's now 35, so that must have been 36 years ago. And uh, what I did <coughs> is I spoke to the local Morristide, who I happened to be a member of by then, because I joined them, that was Mad Jacks, and said, I, you know, I found all this information, and I really think we ought to take it out. <coughs> and so we did, with the assistance of some people from London, that I knew, who had been taking out the depth of Jack just uh, a couple of years before that. And... Uh, I went to Hastings Borough Council and said, we're going to take this thing out. Do you mind? No, we haven't got a problem. So we took it out. The next year, I went to Hastings Borough Council and said, any chance of some money if we take this thing out? And uh, they said, well, yes, maybe. Um, if, you, if you could bring a large number of Morris dancers into the town over the May Day weekend, we'll give you some money. So I said, yeah, we can do that. And then went away and worried about how we were going to do that. <clears throat> we tried. We invited a large number of Morrisites. And uh, yeah, um, they came. And from then, it has grown. There, I haven't got any here, but there's some photographs of us in the early years. <clears throat> and there are 20 or 30 of us in the street with a jack in the green. And nobody else. Just nobody else. And um, now we're talking 20 to 30,000 people coming down to see it. Uh, certainly not what was envisaged at the time. Um, <clears throat> so this is it, as you, would, as you would know it presently, in the old town of Hastings, 
with uh, Jack and the Green, his entourage, the bogeys. I'll come back to how they have evolved. They are an interesting thing. Mad Jacks behind that, the May Queen behind that, Hannah's Cat, the other local team, and then all the teams lined up all the way down there, all the way down the road. <coughs> so, who owns Jack in the Green? Well, as far as I'm concerned, Jack in the Green is owned by the community. And uh, it's a community-based thing, and it's a community-based event, and it's a community-based festival. Um, this is Mad Jacks Morris, and, and, and they, along with Hannah's cat, have been looking after it <clears throat> for the far past 10 years. But before that, it was the chimney sweeps. And before that, uh, who knows? Probably just the chimney sweeps. And in the future, will it still be the Morris or will it have moved on? <clears throat> There's already groups of people on the committee who are not Morris dancers, who are not in the Morris, who are not involved in the Morris who are in drumming groups or just interested people. So is it going to evolve away from the Morris? Who knows? Because one of the things that I think makes it work and one of the things that I think makes the Morris work <clears throat> is that it's not a fossil. It's when, 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 when we revived it, I was very keen to be sure that it was a living tradition and that if it was going to work, it had to be a living tradition. It had to be allowed to evolve in its own way. Uh, although having said that, two years ago, might be three now, we had to put a stop to the number of people turning up who were banging drums because it had become ridiculous. And there were just too many. So I suppose it's a controlled evolution, you might call it. Drummers. An interesting phenomenon. These are actually a local Samba group, uh, Samba Lanco, who now join in. Uh, but there, there's this whole interesting phenomenon, uh, Sussex drumming, which is kind of spreading throughout the country. And a, a quick advertisement here, if you care to look in the next edition of Living Tradition magazine, <clears throat> I have written an article on the evolution of Sussex drumming because I, I think what we've got here is a, a new tradition that has grown. And I, I just happen to have been in the right places at the right time to have seen it grow and know where it comes from and know who the movers and shakers are. But that's a, an aside. That's a whole thing in itself. <coughs> we have invited giants along to Hastings Jack in the Green. Um, there are a couple of reasons for this. Uh, when I was in London, I say I was involved with uh, the Grand Order of Geezers under Dave Lobb, and he was very keen on bringing dancing giants back into England. They had existed before Henry VIII, and Henry VIII abandoned them, and they were something that was kind of prime for revival. They're found across Belgium, and they're found across Catalonia, and they're found across northern France still as existing traditions <clears throat> and they have been been brought back into England and, and we try to have giants within Hastings Jack and Green. Uh, sometimes we do, sometimes they don't because they're actually expensive and difficult things to actually move around the country and so on. Um, but we, we, we do try to include them and they, they also, the, the, the French traditions have been quite a an important influence on, 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 on the thinking. <clears throat> After about ooh, two years of Jack and the Green existing, this is Barry Jones with the Green Brush. Barry phoned me up and said, hello, I'm Barry Jones, I'm the local chimney sweep. I said, hello, Barry, I could do with my chimney being swept, was a good. And he said, well, that's not what I'm calling about, but I'll come and do it. Did you know that Jack and the Green used to be with the sweeps? And I said, yes, Barry, of course I do. I can tell you all about it. And we went into a long conversation. And he said, so you shouldn't be doing it. We should. And I said, yes, Barry, you're quite right. However, you didn't, did you? And if you didn't do it, it 
Somebody had to. And he said, yeah, you got a point there. And I said, but if you want to come along and join in. And he said, great. And he's been along ever since. And they've got their own group. And that's fantastic. <laughs> um, and Barry's a good friend now. Um, <clears throat> the Jack and the Green itself. This is, this is the Hastings Jack and the Green. Um, there, are, there are a number of things about it which, which are of interest. Um, it's dressed in rhododendron. Now, the, the uh, scientists among you, or gardeners amongst you, might know that rhododendron are not an indigenous British species. They come from, I think it's Australia or is it New Zealand? One or the other, I think it's Australia. <clears throat> but they're not, certainly not an indigenous British species. I think they're Australian. Yeah. And uh, so why did we choose it? Well, a number of reasons. It gives a good coverage without an excessive amount of weight. <coughs> Rhododendron leaves are also quite oily. So you can make it over a period of two or three days without them losing their uh, structure, without them shriveling. Also, because it's come from Australia, it's now considered in this country to be an invasive species. So it's a weed. And therefore, we can slaughter it with impunity and nobody makes a fuss. So there's very good green reasons for doing it. <clears throat> the um, crown, the original Jack in the Green did wear a crown. You can see it in that photograph earlier. I could run back and find it. <clears throat> that we have a crown of flowers on it made by a local florist. The original Jack in the Green had a, a face hole sort of there, if you can see where I'm pointing. <clears throat> and that's so the person who was carrying it could look out and, and see where they were going. And according to the original uh, documents, that's where they would pass the pewter pot in and out to, to, to keep him drinking. Um, we have covered the face hole. Um, but you can still see out through the rhododendron. But we, somebody decided that Jack and the Green looked strange without a face. So this is a contemporary idea. Uh, we have put a face on it at the top there. <clears throat> and we've had a number of faces over the years made by a number of different people. We've had them made by local artists. We've had them made by uh, Dave Lobb. In fact, if you can see this, this is, this is the... Uh, <clears throat> The face that was made by Dave Lobb, and that just happens to be an advertisement for my book on it, Hastings Jack and the Green, which is available from Hastings Borough Council. <clears throat> uh, so, uh, but our, our recent face, this one here, it was made by actually one of the bogies, uh, Marty Dean, who is also an artist, and uh, there it is. And he tells me that it's a composite of the faces of all the people that carry it. And I think it probably is. Apparently it's got my nose and somebody else's mouth and, and all the rest of it. So who are these bogeys? <clears throat> right, they are an entirely contemporary idea. If you look back to the uh, original 19th century um, photograph, you can see that the people who were with the Jack and the Green were carrying, uh, had, had rag coats. In the first couple of years, we tried uh, Morris dancers carrying it, but it just didn't work with this person in bright, sparkling white going in and coming out, especially when they came out, they were covered in mud and who knows what else. <clears throat> so uh, we realised that you know, it'd be better if the people who were carrying it were kind of camouflaged to look like it. This idea is not entirely our idea at all. It actually came from Dave Lobb in London. Uh, he's now up in Warrington. And uh, it was to, to basically recreate the European wild men. And if we move on to the next photograph, this is La de Gaste At. La Ca the de, de Gaste At is a annual festival, 400 years old plus that goes on in Ack, uh, just south of Brussels. <clears throat> and uh, its main object uh, are these dancing giants. It goes on for three days, no, two days, and it, it's wonderful. And I've been, we've been on many an occasion. 
And the very first year we went, I was absolutely, this is before Jack in the Green, I was absolutely astounded to see these guys here. <clears throat> We've got this guy here and the one on the, on, on the right. The one on the right is obviously a, a devil figure and he carries a bladder and goes around bladdering people. <clears throat> the one on the left <coughs> is an homme de foy. And les hommes de foy uh, are leaf men. And you probably can't see it very well, but his costume is covered in ivy leaves and each live ivy leaf has covered in Vaseline and they've all been sewn on by hand. These are actually the local dustmen, believe it or not. That's their job. Uh, in, on, on the, the cast is, is, is to do this. <clears throat> but they don't do anything. They just stand around looking interesting, but they don't do anything. Whereas the ones in Hastings have become not only Jack Carriers, but also have got the idea of the European wild man very much in their head. <clears throat> and there's all sorts of arguments about how you become one. These days, you can't become one unless you were invited by the others. That's the only way you get in is if you're invited by the others. <clears throat> how do you get invited? Well, you have to you have to show yourself to be a suitable person. <clears throat> how do you know if you're a suitable person? Well, <clears throat> there are people from in the community who show they've got a, a sense of fun, but also a sense of uh, daring, I suppose. They're also capable of carrying the thing. And... Uh, When they're initiated, uh, they, they, they don't get much of a talk, but they, they, there's one thing in the talk that happens. I, I stand there and I, I, draw, I draw a line on the ground. And I say, see that? That's the line. I say, what line? I said, the line between what people might accept as being acceptable and what is totally unacceptable. <coughs> I said, if you cross that line, you're out. If you go up to that line, that's where you need to be because people are on edge all the time thinking, what's he going to do next? But you never do. And they find that interesting and exciting. But if you cross it, <coughs> you've gone too far. And it's, it's, it's a balance. And we haven't always got it right. And I'm sure Fee could argue with me for hours about that. <laughs> if you want. <laughs> Um, and there's an awful lot of, uh, of managed chaos. Um, one of the things that we've always said is we spend all year working incredibly hard <laughs> to make it look utterly spontaneous. And that's a really important thing that you, you need to um, you need to know when you when to say to somebody, OK, it's time to rein it in now yeah. and, and to know that they will. Yeah. So they've got, they've got to trust them. Uh Dare I say it, there's a there's a degree of, uh, I don't know if it's nepotism or whether it's just tradition going on there now as well, that the way it's turning out, and it wasn't deliberate by any means because they still had to be elected, is that a large number of them are now sons of the originals. So it's beginning to go down through families, <clears throat> which is interesting. So it wasn't designed that way, but just that's, that's the way it's turning out. <clears throat> so we'd dance this thing around the town in the morning. And in the afternoon, we used to go up to Hastings Castle, which was a lovely place. It was kind of intimate and so on. Outdoor, overlooking the sea. And it's fantastic. We also had some old walls to protect us from the wind and rain and so on. Um, but the castle has a capacity of 500 people. <clears throat> We've tried various ways of dealing with it, but eventually realised the thing had become so big that we've had to move to the hill outside the castle. Now, to a lot of people, this has caused a large amount of regret because it's lost its intimacy. But at the same time, it's helped it to grow. It's lost its intimacy and uh, 
<clears throat> but at the same time, it's got bigger. And uh, of course, that also requires a lot more management. So once again, we're, you know, we started being with 20 or 30 people going up the road, and we've now got 20,000 people on the hill <clears throat> with a PA system and a stage and toilets and craft fairs and, and you name it, all going on. And lots of ancillary activities in the evenings with Kayleys, and, and you know, so it all gets massive. Now, here's an interesting point. We didn't know how to finish it. <laughs> we considered all sorts of things. And in fact, in the early years, <clears throat> tried a number of things. In the first year, we, we did it like a mama's play and just kind of killed it. And we thought, oh, that don't work. In another year, we tried throwing it in the sea. <clears throat> now, that don't work. And then <clears throat> relatively early on, we noticed that people wanted to steal leaves from the Jack in the Green. And we were going around saying, no, no, you can't do that. You can't do that. You can't do that. You're going to strip it there. But people wanted the leaves. <clears throat> and so eventually we got to the point where we realised that people wanted these leaves so much <clears throat> that when it was over, what we ought to do is just give them leaves. And I think that year the squire of Mad Jacks picked the flower off the top of the crown <clears throat> and stood there and says, does anybody want a flower? And everybody surged forward and we all knew what to do. I've got a feeling that that was Dave, wasn't it? It was Marshall. Oh, was it Marshall? Yeah. <clears throat> um, Marshall Coombs. Marshall Coombs, yeah. Everybody knew what to do. And uh, and, and from that point on, we, we now strip it bare and we distribute the leaves and the flowers to everybody. <clears throat> and they all go away with them thinking they've got something really big and important and special for good luck and all the rest of it. But in fact, it's them that decided that's what they wanted, if you get what I mean. And uh, yeah, so and, and there we have the, the, the handing out of leaves. And this is a, <clears throat> it's difficult to take a photograph of it. And we've got the Jack in the Green laying on its side there. We've got bogeymen kind of wandering around. And we've got just hordes of people just coming in with their hands up as we're throwing these leaves out, trying try, try to give them to people. Any questions or thoughts or how might we, uh, how might you set up such a thing? Would you want to set up a thing? How do you do a risk assessment? I don't mind. Anything you want to ask. I hope that was useful and interesting and not, I hope it's worth seeing. Nothing. Maybe Silence. You, Gosh, it was bad. Can you your, yeah. Can you use the raise hand function if you want to? <laughs> it's in the participant screen if you want to ask Keith a question. Or face. <laughs> Susan Anderson. <laughs> and I want to know where the name Bogey came from. Oh, right. Yes, that's a good story. Um, <laughs> where do you think? That's a hilarious <laughs> story, actually. <clears throat> um, we painted ourselves green, we put these, these things on and we were sitting in the pub one night and someone said we need a name and one of the idiots said, well I think we ought to call ourselves bogeys because we green and get up people's noses <clears throat> so we did and it was just a bit of a joke and we just called ourselves bogeys and <clears throat> wrote to, and we just popped it in the local press that hey, Jack in the Green would be out with his bogeymen the local journalist was very, very interested in about this name. Thank you, Heather. And sorry, she just brought me a drink. And uh, instead of just asking me, looked it up and, and discovered that bogey or bogeyman was a woodland sprite or spirit. So he put in the paper, Jack in the Green with his bogeyman. By the way, bogeyman means woodland sprite or spirit. And, okay, here comes the pun, and it's stuck. <laughs> okay, we've got Barry Goodman. Hello, Keith. Thanks for the talk. That was really interesting. Hi, um, brought back a lot of memories of, uh, of Hastings. Well, you're always yeah. welcome, as you know. Oh, thank you very much. That's very kind of you. Even though I don't dance at Redbourne Stoke, in fact, even though Redbourne Stoke don't dance anymore, but there you are. Um, my question really is about bogeys as well. Um, I noticed that all your bogeys are male. 
<laughs> is there any is there any thoughts of <laughs> female bogies or bogeyettes uh, or uh, whatever they might be? It, it, it's actually not true. Um, <clears throat> the, the main reason they are male <clears throat> is because you have to actually be able to lift and carry the jack in the green. <clears throat> and anybody who is too short or too small wouldn't be able to do so. <clears throat> but that's the only reason now. They, they were uh, all male. And ooh, 10, maybe more years ago now, because time goes fast when you get older, doesn't it? <clears throat> we were up at the uh, car shortened straw jack because uh, us jack in the green enthusiasts go around the country looking at others and joining others and all the rest of it. <clears throat> and so we were up at the car shortened straw jack uh, in, in, in South London in autumn. And that's a heavy beast. And the jack in the green was dancing through the park in car shortened. And one of the guys came over and said, Look at that dance. I hope you're impressed. I said, I am. Who's in that? And he said, just you wait and see. It dropped and out popped my daughter. <laughs> <laughs> and she was, by acclamation, there on the spot by all of the bogeys that were there, told that she was welcome to carry the jack at any time. And she was the first actual female jack carrier that we had in Hastings. <clears throat> um, she's now actually moved on to a different role, uh, but it's just the way it is. Yeah. Uh, I think that the other thing is if you're going to make your own um, jack in the green or whatever, is that is that you make it for the, the, the people who are going to be there <sighs> to carry it. As I said, that the thing about the milkmaids is that they were farm worker women, so they were massively strong. So there's no reason why any woman shouldn't carry a jack in the green. But what you've got to bear in mind is you have a frame and and obviously you can you can get lots of expertise from people who've built them and from gianters who will tell you all about the leverage and and how to have it and a um, on a structure on your body but then you've got to cover it with um, these uh, with le these leaves and we go and pick the leaves and we're taking them back in um, in in uh, rubbish bags so it is heavy so you do have to build that one in and certainly with the Hastings Jack in the Green the bogies do swap over every few yards because our Jack dances it doesn't just walk along and it is tiring so you know you there's no reason why they shouldn't be. You've just got to, to do the thinking beforehand. And the way it's built, you, you, you've got to be between about five foot eight and six foot. If you're below five foot eight, you're not going to get enough clearance on the floor. And if you're over six foot, it's going to it's going to get top heavy. So the, the, you know, it's, it's, it's a solid structure. It's, it, you can't faff around changing sizes of straps inside. It is. Uh, and so so you, you've got to be a certain size. So if there's, a, if there's a woman who's between five foot eight and six foot who's capable of lifting something and dancing, they're in. <laughs> Brilliant. We've got a question here from Zoe Chan. Um, she hasn't been able to raise her jack, uh, her um, her hand. She's saying, um, are the bogies exclusive to Jack in the Green with no other historical background? Yep. <laughs> they are. I so said their historical background is based on the on the poet the app and uh, on the European wild men. That's where they come from. I think one of the things that's important to understand about what we do is that um, <clears throat> it's not invented so much as carried on, but if you're going to survive in the world that we live in, you have to adapt. Um, I, I may mention earlier that we couldn't do this without the support of Hastings Borough Council. If you want to put on something like this, um, pretty much you've got to uh, you've got to have a two year plan to to build it. Go and see your local council and don't just say we want to do this. Um, what are you going to do to help? Ask them how they can help and how you can help your council as well. Um, 
it's handy to know a bit about your local council to see what their priorities are in terms of funding and how you can get some help on this. But um, you 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 do need to bear in mind that that it is a living thing. As I said earlier, um, you have to have managed chaos um, and and how you build it up and how you have traditions that they are always going to be unique to you to 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 you. Um, if something doesn't work, then it doesn't stay for any longer. But the bogies work, and um, and we we spent sort of quite a long time sort of bringing sort of bringing them into it, so that so that they feel that what they're doing, that that you know that we are all one, that we're all doing things for the same uh, from this for the, for the same end, really. I think the magic words, if you're going to ask for funding, are community cohesion. They like that at the moment. Those are the current magic buzzwords. Um, but that's, I mean, the, the important thing is, <clears throat> and it goes for any traditional custom, if it's going to work, you have to have the community behind you. As soon as the community is no longer interested, you've lost it. Uh, we have found this in Sussex Bonfire. <clears throat> Many of the Sussex villages have become dormitory towns for London where people only come and live at the weekend and the rest of the week there's no one living there at all. In all of those dormitory towns they've lost their customs, they've lost their Sussex bonfire because the people, they're, they're not locals. You know, It's got to be the community. If the community are on side you're away. You've got it. As soon as you lose the community you might as well pack up and go or in the case of us we just carry on regardless with a small thing with about 20 of us the way we started. But we're not going to stop. Uh, Kathy, you've got a hand up. If you unmute yourself, Kathy. Hello. Um, I just wanted to point out, which people might already know, but um, I was born in the States, and uh, a boogeyman is what your mum threatens you with when you're little if you've been naughty. So it's it, both sides of the Atlantic. It goes back to the um, the wild man. The, the figure that's threatening you that's going to get you if you're bad. Just wanted to share that. Yeah. I know that uh, Napoleon was uh, was the was was the bogeyman for two hundred yeah. years. Yeah. Yeah. Um, going back to community cohesion, there are two ways of getting support in Hastings for anything. The first is to support the lifeboats, which will be essential in any seaside town. And the other is to support the parish. And we have um, the parish of All Saints and St. Clements. And we have a festival service on the Sunday of, of, uh, of Jack in the Green. And that is specifically to tie in with the people of Hastings. It's not necessarily anything other than that and because Jack in the Green is completely apolitical and um, is it secular is the word I want? Mm. It has no religious affiliation whatsoever. It, it is entirely a, <clears throat> a means to an end. We've always said um, that if people want to come along and dance in the church, that's fabulous. Um, if they don't want to, they want to dance outside, that's equally good. And I've always said that if we were um, located in St. Leonard's, which is the other side of town, where there is a, a mosque, if we were dancing there, we would make representations to, to the chair of the mosque to say, um, can, can we become involved? Would you like to, to, to be a part of, uh, of what we're doing? So think about where it is that you live and how much you want to involve your community, how you can make it easy for your community to be involved. And you also need to make sure that you have the local politicians on your side. Uh, that's taken a lot of time, uh, but if there is any town, function of any kind uh <clears throat> i try and make sure that i'm there and that i'm seen to be there yeah keith's really good at that i've got no patience um, i'm told to, i've got to the go. brownest nose on the planet <laughs> keith, keith, can, keith can go and talk to people like that i've just got no patience at all um yeah i, I remember when i was uh 
seen at Jack in the Green having breakfast with the MP who is in a party that is completely different to the party that I would support. And people afterwards are going, how could you even speak to that woman? And I said, this is how we get things done. <laughs> it, it, that, that, um, that also ties in with what I said before. If you, if you, if you on a, an organisational level, if you want to put something on, um, go and see your, your council and see what their, their um, priorities are. Uh, the late Roy Domit. Um, who, as you all know, was a, um, a, a fab, one of our best Morris researchers. Um, he also did a huge amount of work for the, uh, the Ministry of Defence, and he was very good at briefing cabinet um, and the um, and, sub <laughs> and successive American presidents because he understood um, what people's um, criteria were, and he could brief according to policy. Um, so you do have to to have a diversity of, of skills in your organisation. One of the questions we've got here from Pauline is to say, what do we think made it so popular to go from 2,000 to 20,000 people? And that's a very interesting question. To which that I don't know. That's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. I, it's going to sound very trite. Um, I think it's just one of those things where the time was right <laughs> because it wasn't only the Hastings Jack and the Green that took off over that period. The Rochester Sweeps took off over that period. Um, Sussex bonfires grew like Topsy over that period. Um, and I, I think the time was just right for that sort of thing to start to happen. Heather, have you got any ideas on that? So Heather's my wife who's <laughs> sitting behind me listening. Well, Community. Yeah, community. They were yeah. able to buy in and join in because of the greening, and it's an easy thing to do to wear an easy thing and also the, the current with the policy. Did, did you hear that? Recycling, you know, green. Yeah, pe pe people were able to buy in because the costume was relatively easy to make. That was something that they could join in. It was a community based thing. <clears throat> and at the same time, also actually ties in, although it wasn't deliberately so with things like the green movement and ecology and environment, et cetera, et cetera. Just makes people, you've got to do something that makes people feel good. Yeah. I mean, that's it. It, it, it. It's a happiness factor. If it makes people feel good, it's going to work. And if it doesn't cost them any money, even better. We, uh... Um, I did a, um, a back of the envelope survey a few years ago, and we do bring a huge amount of money into the town at the beginning of a tourist season. And Hastings has always been quite an economically deprived town um, because we have people we, we we put this on and we say, if you want to, to, to come here, well, you know, find yourself a hotel, find yourself a restaurant, crack on with it. So we do. Um, we do kind of spider out the money for uh, for local businesses and they feel supported as well. Uh, we, we are all volunteers um, and we feel passionately that that we are giving our time. Um, I, I came to Hastings um, um, in my very early 20s it's been a very good town to me and to my family. Um, and it's, it's, it's very important to give something back. We've got a lot of um, organisations um, putting on things and they, they, they have a paid administrator and they're running for profit. And that's, that's, that's fine. That's up to them how they do it. It's up to them. But we feel passionately that we're all volunteers and we wouldn't do it um, if it was a business. No, we do it completely for the. I mean, I mean, having said that, <clears throat> I mean, I mean, Pete's quite right. I mean, the the publicans tell me that uh, it kicks off their year. The restaurant owners, the hoteliers, it kicks off their year uh, after after the hardness of winter in tourist town, and 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 they re and, and that this year because of COVID, and it didn't happen. This you know this really really helped made them suffer. <clears throat> I've uh, I've got a point here from Barry P. Um, who remembers talking to a publican a few years back 
um, and regarding my deprivation point, um, his thoughts were that he makes almost a year's income over that weekend. Yeah, that sounds about... Sorry about my clocks are all going to go off now. Yes. <coughs> um, and... Yeah, sorry, here comes the other clock. <laughs> so um, does anybody feel that they would like to organise something, not necessarily this year, but anybody wants to start thinking about organising anything. Um, Keith's talked about the ethos and I've talked about the, um, the mechanism. Does anybody feel inspired or does anybody think that they could put something on? It's, it's not something that I deliberately set out to do. I, I was just going to take out a Jack in the Green with 20 people and I was quite happy with that. Uh, but it, it's, it's grown of its own accord and it's grown organically over a large number of years. <clears throat> I mean, one of the things that B doesn't know is that very often I can walk into a pub in town. Every pub in town will now go, hello, Keith. And it's not just because I'm drinking them, all of them. But the number of times I walk in, there's a pint, there's a pint on the bar before I even get to the bar. And uh, don't worry about that. You do, Jack, in the green. That's fine. You know, so there's, there's some benefits. <laughs> Emmanuel Friedman's made the point. It's hard to plan anything now with the future of public events being so uncertain. Yes, you're absolutely right. Yeah. Um, Next year, we've got plan A, plan B, plan C, yeah. plan D and plan E. Yeah. Seriously. And um, Harry um, <laughs> has said, um, it's a fantastic job of. Oh, hang on a second. I'm, I'm getting. Um, I'm getting lots of uh, things here. Right, Harry is saying, uh, wondering what. I'm wondering when what starts as a personal project becomes a real tradition. Is it when the original organisers uh, can step away and somebody else carry it on? Um, so yes, so how how does it go from being um, a thing that we liked doing to being something that's quite big? And I think that that's a difficult question to answer because it's it, it's it's um, it's it, it is kind of organic. Mm. I think organic is the word we both used it, haven't we? I think that's yeah. true. <clears throat> it did it all by itself. Um. Yeah. Um, so, so David is saying that um, he's he's got enough uh, with our Christmas mummers play to write. He'd, he'd love to come one year. Um, and uh, Jenny is saying uh, what I love about Jack in the Green is the number of townspeople who dress up and the number of houses decorated with ribbons and garlands, etc. We do we do send notes round to every house and every business saying, please decorate your house. We also say, um, if you'd like us to come and decorate it um, for um, a moderate fee, um, we'll do that. And we it, it's really nice when people do that, when people uh, feel that they own it. And the other thing that you've got to bear in mind is that not everybody likes everything. We do have a couple of uh, uh, business uh, people who, who who really don't like it because uh, they feel that their um, their trade is diminished over that weekend. And you have to respect that. So you have to be sensitive. If you're putting something on, on somebody's doorstep, um, they may not like it. And Emmanuel is asking, would Jack in the Green be out of place in Yorkshire? They've got their own things. <laughs> no, not necessarily. I mean, it's it's definitely an urban tradition. It definitely sprang out of London. But having said that, <clears throat> it's got children, if that makes sense. Uh Bristol has a Jack in the Green, which is based entirely on the Hastings Jack in the Green. Ilfracombe has a Jack in the Green, which is based entirely on the Hastings Jack in the Green. <clears throat> so I can't see why not Yorkshire. Has anybody got any more questions or points? I think most people are choosing to, uh, to send stuff in the chat rather than... Uh speak anybody else got anything to say oh 
hang on a second. Uh, Barry P is saying, uh, David Wears, a local resident, Piers Golden and himself are still hopeful of doing our planned book for the next Jack in the Green, having had to postpone it this year. That's good. Yes, this year has been a really, really odd, bizarre year. Um, I think one of the things that I found incredibly heartening is how adaptable people have been um, in all kinds of ways. Um, lots of people have just gone straight online um, and done things. And we were approached by Isolation Station Hastings, who are a group of um, creatives who said, oh, by the way, we really love Jack in the Green. We know you're not going to be able to do it this year. Um, and we've got it all sorted. We're, we're ready to broadcast it. Um, and we know it's only 10 days to go, but uh, what do you think? And we said, um, <coughs> OK, um, we've never done this before. What should we do? And there's no problem. We'll send you a, we'll, we'll send you a, send you a schedule. Boom. So we did all of that. And that was it. And they were brilliant. And it 20, was 20,000 um, people worldwide. <clears throat> to the extent that people have said, this has been so good. Can you broadcast it live every year? So we're looking into how we are going to live stream it in the future. That's that's organic growth again. It was it was quite amazing to see how people had adapted a street procession to um, in their um, in their bedrooms and in their dining rooms. Bye bye, Mo Miller. Lovely to see you. Bye, Barry. Lovely to see you. Yeah. So, uh, and and it does say it does it does make a a degree of intimacy when you suddenly see people's houses, um, and there is a a feeling of a, of a shared event as well. It was so nice walking around town, and we were meant to be in isolation and all that. We walked around town anyway, just just to look, and the number of houses that were just decorated anyway. It's fantastic to see. I speak? Please do. Who's speaking? Me. Hello, you. Jennifer. Hello, Jennifer. Hello. <laughs> I was thinking about the question of um, organically growing something and starting from something small and how it grows spontaneously by itself. I started about maybe six years ago thinking we can't go carol singing in the middle of a city because it's cold and damp. And if people want to come and they need the toilet, there isn't one. So I started jingling bells in the church in Southampton, which is in the middle of the city. And it's really a, a little list of carols, which I lead accompanied by a piano and children are encouraged to dress up as they would for a shepherd or a, an angel. I make a decoration in front of the altar and we have colored scented candles. It started with me thinking, we'll let people elect which charity they wish to donate to. And they could bring something for the tea, which we have afterwards. And then I thought life's all about money. It's boring. How about if we had a bag in the front and everybody just bought an item of clothing that they don't need and we give it to the homeless. That has grown and grown. And it's still, I've got it booked for this year. I don't know if we'll be able to do it, but it's incredibly successful. We've taken probably, oh, hundreds all through the year, hundreds of bags of clothing for the homeless to a local charity. People come from all over the place and bring bags and bags and bags of clothing. And they love the carols and they love the tea. I don't provide any food, it all just comes. And I start by advertising that in a what's on in Southampton, probably say in July, ready for December. And then putting it in the newsletter and we've got a website, of course, and it just grows and grows and grows by itself. I didn't know that was gonna happen at all. It was supposed to be just one off, but just a little idea of how something has a creep all by itself. <clears throat> That's lovely. Um, two two things as a result of that. I mean, that is absolutely gorgeous. Two things of that. You, you does everybody is aware that there's. Uh, I hope that there's a, a study that was done um, about five years ago 
that has shown that altruism is its own reward, that doing things for other people actually benefits ourselves even if we uh, if we don't get anything from it so i think that that's a really important thing um and jenny has said to remind everybody uh where we can donate i can't remember where that uh, where that link is yeah, but yes when on. yes we're now the green website i'll do that at the end yes we are yes we're now a charity so uh, yeah. Yes, so I mean, doing doing that that that's a lovely idea, Jennifer. That's just brilliant, and it's beautiful, isn't it? The way it just expands. The important thing is, although I'm a Catholic and it's in a Catholic church, it's very big, but it's non-denominational. There's no priest involved. It's it's something which simply is a bit like going carol singing. All the lights and the and the smell of the cinnamon and the smell of the mince pies being heated up. It's really evocative of Christmas and. To me, it's important that children should gain that experience of the anticipation of Christmas. It's all about, at the moment, Father Christmas and writing letters to him. But it should be about those lovely smells and the feeling of excitement and the children coming up onto the altar, wanting to light the candles. And then one of the other things that I find they love is if I say to them, would you like to go and ask a grown up to come and light a candle? And they love that, going and choosing their grown-up and bringing the can. Bringing, that is so, it's lovely to see the power that the children feel <laughs> that they have by having a grown-up. It's the reverse of what normally happens, isn't it? But it's little things like that, little tweaks that give it this cuteness factor. <laughs> and that's what people seem to love. Anyway, enough for me. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Quite funny you mentioning Father Christmas as I got myself a Christmas job, as you can probably tell. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> if anybody, right, so Pauline has um, has sent um, the link if you would like to uh, to send um, any kind of donation. Uh, you don't have to, it's optional. Um, but as I say, we are now a charity, so we have to be, we have to be all very grown up and very responsible. Um, um, any other questions? If not, I will thank Keith and hand back to Pauline. No? Well, well thank, thank you. you for listening, everybody. I hope you found it interesting. If any questions come up, don't, don't be afraid to, to ask in the, later or whatever, and we'll answer them. No problem. Right. Thank you very much indeed. I will now hand back to Pauline. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Keith and Fee, for a very interesting talk. Um, all right, so um, thank you very much to yourselves for all coming and uh, joining us today. And um, hopefully see you at the next one. The next one will be um, Making Clogs, demonstration of clog making with Simon Brock in two weeks' time on Saturday afternoon. Um, so that should, that should be an interesting talk as well. <laughs>